Welcome to the Real Estate Disasters Podcast, the most entertaining source for real estate education. On this show, we focus on all the crazy things that people just like you and I have dealt with on their paths to financial freedom through real estate. I am your host, Bobby Klein, accompanied, as always, by everybody's favorite co-host, Logan Zuber. Logan, how you doing, man? Great, Bobby. Nice to see you here. Uh, we're finally set up a little bit better. Not very, This is our second take, third take, kind of, on the intro, but mm -hmm. it'll work. I hate these cameras. I'll just say it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> so we are here to interview the host because when I watch real estate or listen to real estate podcasts, I don't really like not knowing who the host is because... I was like, who's this person telling me what I need to do with real estate? And I don't know anything about them. So the first two episodes are going to be meet the host style episodes. So today we're going to interview Bobby and I don't have a lot of detailed questions. You know, obviously I don't have a pen and paper here. I wanted to kind of flow organically because I know Bobby pretty well. I think we've been hanging out for like probably close to two years now. Yeah. Maybe. Something like that. But in the last six months since we've kind of decided we want to do this podcast, anytime we get close on a good conversation, I'm like, save it for the podcast. And of course, <laughs> I never wrote anything down or anything. So yeah, me either. We're just gonna, <laughs> so we're going to wing it and we're going to see if it comes back organically. Nice. So first off, I got to ask what everybody else is going to ask is how did you get started in real estate? So I got started in real estate. It had always kind of been in the back of my head. Like I always knew I wanted to be in real estate since I was pretty young, like probably 12, 13 years old. Uh, and the reason for that was there was only one wealthy person that I knew, and he owned a bunch of rental properties. So I always kind of knew I wanted to go that direction, you know, seeing financial freedom, which is something that, you know, nobody in my family had. I was like, wow, that's amazing. You know, I, I really wanted that life. So, so for, and for a long time, it was just a thought. I mean, I didn't do anything with it whatsoever. And then in my mid twenties, I was, you know, working a couple dead end jobs, struggling to get by and just really had this moment where I was like, man, like if this is all life is like, I don't want to live it anymore. Like, and I don't, I don't mean I was suicidal or anything like that. I just mean like, I was like, this isn't it for me. Like, you know, I'm working in this factory, working at a restaurant at night afterwards, barely seeing my kid, barely paying my bills, driving a shitty car. That's like 25 years old. That's like all sorts of broken down. Like I was just like, this fucking sucks. <laughs> so like the, the investment that I made back then was I bought an Audible account for $15 a month. And that might not sound like much to somebody who's already listening to this podcast. But like, for me, that was a lot of money. I mean, I did not spend extra money. I always said I was like thrifty. No, I was fucking broke. Mm -hmm. So I spent the $15 a month and just put on their real estate. And I got really lucky. The first book that popped up or the first book that I selected anyways, was the book on real estate investing with no and low money down by Brandon Turner. That's a good first book. <laughs> it's a fantastic first book, dude. Like literally like that book changed my life because even though I hadn't made any money yet, I just started listening to that book in my car while I was driving between my various jobs. And it genuinely broke down how just an average person can get into real estate with very little money. So read that book, started listening to podcasts, you know, education, started talking to the dude that I knew growing up who was in real estate, started going to the local RIAs and doing all that. And, you know, here we are several years later, uh, I've been investing in real estate for just over three years and have right around 60 rental properties. And yeah. Okay. And yeah, I, like I know, uh, we know, and we're not going to get too deep into it, but like you didn't grow up with like a silver spoon. You didn't grow up like your parents were in real estate. You didn't grow up. Oh, like, fuck no, dude. Yeah. Fuck no. So, uh, <laughs> you didn't grow up middle class. You didn't grow up. No, yeah. I was dirt fucking poor dude. So like, uh, you know, uh, we're not going to go into it a whole lot today, but like, you know, my mom is, was a drug addict might still be, I don't know. Uh, my dad was a good dude, but he was poor as shit. Uh, and then he passed away when I was really young. So no, I mean, there was no silver spoon. There was nothing, you know, we didn't, you know, we got the lights shut off all the time. You know, we'd move out in the middle of the night. So the landlord wouldn't fucking know we did all that type of shit. I mean, we were, 
we were poor, poor. From a Vic D to a Vic Durer. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> now I've turned the tables on them. <laughs> you getting your payback finally. <laughs> So what did that, what was your first, inv- cause I don't even know this. What was your first investment property? Dude. So my first investment, my first investment property was a trailer park actually. So oh, like that was the first one. Yeah, dude. Oh, my, uh, my Mintone trailer park. I went from uh, no units to 16 shitty fucking trailers uh, overnight, dude. But the way that came about was I actually found a property that was for sale and they only wanted 10 grand for it. Now it was in like the hood, but like it just looked like it needed like a paint job and like some flooring. And I was like, this is all stuff I can figure out. So I go to buy it off of this wholesaler, which if you don't know what a wholesaler is, Ugh. yeah, that's uh the some scummy guy like Logan. <laughs> uh no, it's a it's a person who finds great deals and sells them off to uh investors or flippers or whatever. Um so I went to buy it off this this wholesaler, and I actually I didn't have 10 grand. I borrowed money from my bank. I borrowed $10,000 from my bank on a personal loan. I told them it was to remodel my kitchen. I was actually a renter at the time. <laughs> like, so, so, oh, so, we're so I lied. Okay, so I lied. No, it's not a mortgage. It's not a mortgage. It's a personal line of credit. Uh, they just needed a reason on there. And I, I didn't want to tell them I'm buying Buy a, a house. Park? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, well, no, no, I was trying to buy this single family home and, uh, like, so we get, get it over to the title company and the title company is like, Hey, this property has $40,000 worth of liens on it, uh, for like child support or something like that. And so my first question was, well, what's a lien? <laughs> so, cause I, I yeah, literally I didn't know anything. Know. Yeah. I didn't know shit. Uh, and then it's a bad thing turns out. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, uh, it turns out, you know, I'm sitting on this 10 grand and, I can't just pay it back to the bank because there's like $500 worth of fees associated with that, which might as well have been $5,000 to me at the time. Because like prepayment penalty was it? Yeah, oh, just, okay. just I mean, the loan came with $500 worth of fees. Oh, so okay. if I paid it back, I still owed 500 bucks, and I was like, that's not fucking happening. Like a fuck you fee. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, money? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So I called the guy that I referenced earlier, and I was just like, I've got this 10 grand. I don't know what to do with it. Like, is there anything I can park it in? And he's like, it's 10 grand, dude. Like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, which is crazy uh, to you for you to hear at that time too. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and so he's like, just pay it back to the bank and, you know, make payments on your 500 bucks, you owe and all that. And I was like, you know, thank you for the advice, but also hell no. And so, you know, I went back to work trying to find a deal and I'd love to say that I found the deal myself, but I didn't. He actually called me back in like two weeks and was like, Hey, I've got a, a buddy of mine who would be interested in selling a mobile home park. I'm not sure that you can handle it, which really ignited the fire. And yeah. I was like, I can handle it. What are you talking about? But he was like, uh, you know, he's got a mobile home park for sale. He needs $300,000 for it. I think it was two ninety five. dollars He was like, but he'll take 10 grand down and then he'll finance the other $285,000, which it might have been like, Again, all these numbers seemed so much bigger to me back then because two hundred eighty-five thousand dollars. You know, I'm making forty grand a year selling cars at this point, so it seemed like so much money. But you know, I we went back and forth. I went and looked at the park, and this, I mean, this is a shitty, rundown park. So like, it's not a mobile home community. It's a trailer park. <laughs> it was a it was a full fledged trailer park. <laughs> we're we're a little bit more of a mobile home community now, yeah. but. Uh, but no, so it's like this shitty mobile home park and, uh, you know, it's trash outside, broken windows, cats running everywhere. Like there was trash all around the dumpster and very little in the dumpster, tons of vacant units and all this. And uh, so the guy who was willing to sell it, he had sold it off on land contract to or triple net lease technically, but he had sold it off to some other investor already who just fucked it up and stopped making payments and all that shit. Oh, so that's good. So the guy who was selling it to me was a very competent dude, uh, but he had sold it to a bad, like he had made a bad deal selling it to this guy. But anyway, so we went through it and he was like, you know what? Like, I just want somebody to get in here and fix it up. So he was like, I'll give you three months, no payments. Yeah. And I was like, holy shit, I can maybe do this. So ended up purchasing that with the 10 grand down. And then for the next three months, I was working five days a week at the car dealership. And then on uh, Tuesdays and Sundays, I was off. And so every Tuesday and Sunday, I was at the mobile home park. 
and learning how to do maintenance. Uh, I'd done a little bit of maintenance in the past, but nothing crazy, nothing to like the level that was needed. So I was just out there learning and screwing up and wasting money, but I had that three month grace period and I was able to, uh, by the time the three months was over, we were actually cash flow positive. Oh, that felt good then. Dude, it was amazing. It was amazing. And then like, I think maybe like two months after that, we were making like a thousand bucks a week. And profit? Yeah, I mean, profit? No, probably when you count in like or was cap, that your income? cap X and all. No, I mean, it was like the income was more than that. But like when you count like cap X and stuff mm-hmm. like that, it probably wasn't profit so much, but it was a thousand dollars over paying all the bills. Oh, okay. So you're saying that. So, you know, I mean, and I didn't have good systems for tracking all that back then. Uh, so, you know, it's hard to say what the true profit was of that. But I know it sure as shit felt like a thousand dollars a week I was making. And that was your so that was your first park then. Still? Yeah, that was my first park, dude. And for somebody who is like now, you know, five months after buying their first property is now making more money in real estate than they are at their current job. I was like, well, my days are numbered here at the car lot for sure. So what year was that you bought the first park? Oh gosh, um, twenty nineteen. Okay. Or, 2018 maybe? I was going to say, because when we, when we met, I think you were still working at the car dealership. I was, yeah. Okay. I for sure was. And so how much longer did you stay there after you... Well, okay. So after I got that going, there was kind of a snowball effect where um, my second property was a 24-unit mobile home park. And so the, uh, the guy that I had bought the first one off of had a friend who owned another one who was in a similar situation who, you know middle-aged, already made their money, you know, just kind of trying to preserve their money more than make more. Mm -hmm. And he was like, Hey, if this kid's doing good over there, I'll do it. I'll do a second deal. So he, he did a similar thing for me. The price was higher. Um, but it was uh, 10 grand down and then he financed, uh, $490,000 for me, but he financed it at like 5% over 30 years, dude. So, I mean, like it's great over seller years, financing. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's really great good. seller financing. So, so yeah, I ended up getting that one and this was, I mean, it's still a trailer park, right? So, I mean, it's not like it's like, you know, the Taj Mahal or anything, but this was substantially nicer than the other one. And it was cash flow positive. And I had learned one trick in the last one. And I was like, well, you give me three months, no payments. <laughs> and I got it. You just uh, asked and it worked. Yeah. And so that was cool because I had actually, I still didn't have 10 grand. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you 60 some trailers and you're still fighting for 10 grand. Yeah. So I borrowed five grand from a local investor. I, I'm not going to say who it I is. Yeah. I'm not going to say who it is because he probably doesn't want a bunch of people calling him being like, give me five grand. Yeah. Uh, but a local investor who's not a lender lent me five grand. I didn't even know the guy at the time. I just had good reputation from from the guy who originally found me the first trailer park. Uh, but then I borrowed five grand from a dude who I worked with as well. And I ended up paying between the two five grand loans within 90 days, that three month period. I paid back the 10 grand plus three grand in interest. So, I mean, it was expensive money, but... Dude, I was off to the races. I mean, now I'm at, you know, what is that? 40 units roughly. And then I think I kept my job for maybe a month after that. I was like, well, because I was like, oh, I, why wouldn't I just be out working on my trailers? Or, it's a waste you know. of your time at that point because you can make more money working on the real estate. Yeah, working, work, working inside the business, you know, which, and I do say in the business because that's absolutely what I was doing at the time was working in the business, not on the business. But you had to at that point. Oh, for sure. Yeah. For sure. I mean, it now was, you're at the point where you can work on the business and not. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm still like, honestly, I'm still in a transition period from that, you know, where mostly it's bad habits that I have to break at this yeah. point. But, you know, I work on the business more than I work in the business now. But yeah, I mean, I left my job and 40 units and never really looked back. So that's a good, I guess, sidebar is, I guess, what do you say to people who might be listening to this and they go, oh, well, you just found somebody to give you five grand or 10 grand and say like, I don't have anybody who can do that because yeah, no, I mean, pretty hard to find, not find somebody who will loan you five grand. Oh, for sure. For sure. And I can, I can tell you like, I'm good at asking for money now. Like I am shameless. Like if I'm raising money for a deal, 
I'm shameless now. I'm just like, hey, I've got a great opportunity. You know, because I, I bet the deals first. I don't bring bullshit to people. I bring a good deal to them. I'm like, this is an opportunity, blah, blah, blah. When I was asking for five grand as opposed to, you know, I might ask for $100,000 now. When I was asking for five grand, those were the most uncomfortable conversations I ever had. Yep. It was terrifying. It was absolutely terrifying. And if you let that stop you, then you'll never have those conversations because you don't know somebody. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. You work in a factory. Okay. Who, who's the general manager of the factory? That guy's got five grand. Yeah. Who's your, yeah. Who's your uh, aunt, uncle, neighbor who's got their house paid off and has a home equity line of credit that mm-hmm. you're, you know, you don't know to ask these things. And let, I mean, you got to research. Mm-hmm. I mean, you got to do your yeah. homework. Don't go in there blind. No, I mean, don't go in there stupid. I'm not saying rush it, but you know, a, a big part of like the investor who lent me the, the one half of the down payment, that five grand. He didn't really know me. We hadn't really had a whole lot of conversations, but I was at the the local RIAs. Mm-hmm. I was on the Facebook page. I was making moves. I was out there doing stuff. So he didn't know me, but like he saw that I was out there getting after it. He saw that I was serious. He's and you know, and when I when I brought it to him too, the other the other part of this is bring a good deal to people. It was pretty easy when I showed all the numbers and I, I didn't like, like you said, prepare. I didn't come to him just like, Oh, Hey, do you think it would be cool if like, uh, maybe you like, uh, you wrote me a check, (laughs) you know, I came to him. I explained what I was looking at. I explained what the deal was. I explained what the terms were. I explained to him that I had, you know, in this particular case, I had three months, no payments. So the money I was collecting, the first thing I was going to do was pay him off. You know, I gave him a great return. I didn't, bitch about the fact. In fact, I offered it. I offered him $1,500 return on five grand. Wow. Yeah. Within six weeks. Wow. So that's a, I can't, I'm not good at math, but like, that's a huge return. That's gigantic. (laughs) Yeah. It's gigantic, you know? And it didn't matter because it's what got the deal done. So I didn't get bogged down in that. Now, would I pay that money every day now? Well, no, because I'm in a different spot, but you're a different spot with a different network. I mean, back then, uh, when we were in the RIA getting started, I mean, there was a group of us, there was me, you, I want to say like Tony Dakota and a few other guys who were yeah, all Jordan just, Wildman. Jordan, uh, we were all getting started at the same time and we were hustling. Like we mm-hmm. weren't just there. I mean, we were at every meeting. We were messaging those guys all the time, mm-hmm. asking questions, asking the right questions to mm-hmm. where, you know, I feel like they would have gave, you know, if all of us came to him with a deal, they would give it to us because they saw we were hustling and now we're kind of in the group. And now, I mean, you and Jordan have taken, you know, your co-host of the RIA now. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny how that works. But yeah, I mean, for sure it was, uh, it was definitely, it was, we had set ourselves up unknowingly in all fairness. (laughs) I had unknowingly put myself in a position to where I was the type of person that somebody who has kind of been there, done that would want to help out. And it's just through hustling. You're out there doing stuff and people see that. And, you know, people want to help people who help themselves. You know, you and I have had so many conversations about that. Like, I am not interested in going to work for you if I'm going to be working as hard or harder than you. Oh, yeah. But if you're out there busting your ass and you need somebody to help give you a leg up, like, I'm happy to help however I can. Like, what's what's the quick story about the the kid who asked you to he made asked you to buy him lunch or something? Oh God, yeah. So, <laughs> this is a good story. yeah. So this is a pet peeve of mine. So, and apparently I'm the only person that this happens <laughs> to. Is. I don't know what the fuck my problem is, but people are just like, "Hey, would you go get a coffee with me? Great, buy your own shit." If you ask somebody out to coffee, buy their fucking coffee. If you ask them out to lunch, buy their fucking lunch. Like it, like that should be like you should know that already, but. Shame on me for not vetting people enough. But this particular guy, I went to I went to high school with him, and he uh, he sent me this message. And now I'm remembering that we're friends on Facebook. He might hear the story. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Be a good remem- for him. Remember it and don't do it again. <laughs> uh, no. So he sent me a uh, he sent me a message, and he was like, "Hey man, I see what you're doing. I think it's awesome. I'd love to meet up and chat with you sometime." I was doing some research. And if we went out to lunch, you could pay for it with your business account and then write it off on your taxes at the end of the year. So this motherfucker invited me out to lunch to pay for him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it didn't work out. We never ended up getting that fucking lunch. But, <laughs> I mean, 
kudos to him for doing some research. Yeah, you just did the research it, on the wrong thing. Yeah, yeah, that was the wrong research <laughs> yeah. to do. Yeah, it's if there's somebody who you think can genuinely help you advance in your business, it's worth the $20 investment. And I'll be honest, I made a lot of those $20 investments over time. I mean, there's so many people who were so far beyond where I was and still are so far beyond where I am that I was just like, hey, would you let me like buy you lunch on Tuesday? And people have been so generous with their time. I mean, it's again, it helps if you're already out making deals. If you haven't got a deal yet, it can be more challenging because a lot of people want to waste your time is the truth of it. But yeah, I mean, just messaging people and trying to take them to lunch, not have them take you to lunch can be a really powerful tool. And if you're broke, go buy them a coffee and drink water. Hey, like, you know, if you if somebody was like, hey, can I, you know, come see one of your rehab projects oh, that's and just bring you a coffee? Oh. Dude, I'll bet. Do. Oh, man, that's a bet. Good. Love Starbucks. Yeah. Trent a cold brew, one shot of espresso, three pumps of sugar-free vanilla. Bring it to any job site I'm at. <laughs> Open invitation. <laughs> Well, so this is the Real Estate Disasters podcast, so let's get to it. What's the biggest shit disaster that you think you have had happen? Dude, I had so many to go through. Yeah, I was going to uh, say, you have two, <laughs> two trailer parks, and they're not mobile home communities in this instance. With these trailer mm-hmm. parks, they are trailer parks. We have three now. Oh, three trailer parks. I do have three now, Excuse yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. But, okay, so... This was uh, this was when I got the first park, okay? And I don't think I had the second park yet. So I was doing all the maintenance, but I would hire guys at like eight bucks an hour to come help me, right? Just these typically not very skilled laborers who would come out and help me out. And so I got a, uh, I got a, a tenant who was like, hey, I'm not sure what's going on, but in my bathroom behind the access panel to the water heater, I'm hearing weird noises. I don't know what it is. And I'm like, okay. So I go there, you know, I got my little tool bag with me and, uh, I, uh, the access panels there, I'm standing in front of the access panel. The door is immediately to my right. Standing in the doorway is my maintenance helper. And I get my drill out. I take all the screws off of the access panel and I open it up and I kid you not, I hadn't even set it off to the side and I am swarmed by like two possums that just <laughs> ran right out at me. <laughs> and like, I drop the thing. I like fall back against the wall. My maintenance helper slams the door and just fucking <laughs> left Wait, me. Wait, shut on you? He shut it on me. He left me in there to fucking die. And I've got like my drill in my hand, like trying to <laughs> swing at them. And they're, uh, they, they escaped back in behind the water heater. And there's like a hole down into like underneath the trailer. And they like got back out underneath there. But God, I, I shit my pants almost, dude. It was fucking terrifying. Did they mess anything up? No, I, no, they were just nesting back there, dude, because it was warm up inside the trailer, and it was right right by the water heater, which gets nice oh, and toasty yeah. and all that. So we had a, you know, we ended up going underneath there with uh, some, you know, some plywood and shit, and like boarded it up and all that. But yeah, they were just sneaking in and getting warm by the water heater. But they had nested. I mean, it was fucking gross. But I mean, it wasn't like, you know, they hadn't messed with any electrical or anything. Thank God. Well, with like managing three mobile home communities uh you've probably had like what are some like other mini disasters like i know in the teaser you had indicated something about a swat team i'm sure you've had your fair share of druggies fight oh. druggies i don't know if i can say that drug you, you can we are an explicit podcast oh, yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> we are I've, I've said like 15 f-bombs already so uh yeah if you're still listening don't expect that to yeah, not there's, happen there's kids in the car turn it up because i want them to hear me yell it yeah honestly <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, yeah, dude. I, I mean, I've had so many. So like uh, the, the SWAT team story is I was uh, I just happened to be there working on one of my mobile homes and I was I, I saw a cop car go past, which I'm always curious, right? Like you coming in here, you getting one of my tenants. So I just peek my head out and but it didn't have any lights or anything on. So I wasn't thinking anything crazy would happen. Dude, that cop car pulled up to this trailer and then flying in behind it was like the the paddy wagon for the SWAT team. And like, yeah, dude. And then it it pulls up. They park back, you know, 100 feet or so. They get out. They move up there all tactically. They kicked in the door. I saw him throw a flashbang. You're like, great. Just fix that door. (laughs) Dude. 
<laughs> they fucked that door up. <laughs> uh, they kick in the door. They throw a flashbang, which absolutely ruins my linoleum. Uh, and this is like one of like the already remodeled mobile homes that we've done. Like oh, this no, is not like linoleum. <laughs> yeah, not my lino, but no. And then like so like they're in there, and then like it's it's fairly unexciting after that. And then I eventually get to talk to them, and apparently they were uh, they were selling a substantial amount of meth out of there. Ooh. Yeah, and like I was talking to like. I don't know what he what his title is, but he was like a high up police officer, like not in a uniform, wearing a suit, but he was an officer, right? So I don't know what that makes him, but he was whatever the fuck that the is. The guy who's there with the SWAT team wearing a suit. That's he was Commissioner Gordon. Yeah. You know, he was Commissioner Gordon of the situation. And he's telling me that he's had officers in there buying meth for like four months or something. And I'm like, why why do we do this for four fucking months? Yeah. Like <laughs> the officers in the kids, like uh, four months? <laughs> That's dumb. It's like after the uh, first time, you can realize, hey, I bought meth from these guys. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so, but no, there was, uh, I had, so it was my my tenant in there and then her two kids. One was like a 25-year-old guy who was her kid. The other one was like a 17-year-old girl, which is unfortunate. But all three of them got arrested along with a couple other people who were there with them. And yeah, so I was like, well, now what do you do, right? Like... <laughs> I don't know what you do in that situation. So I'm calling around trying to see if they're like getting out of jail ever or anything like that. And like the guy's like, no, like no, nobody's, nobody's coming back here for a long, long time. So yeah. So we had to uh, file for emergency eviction while this place sat empty and like, you know, go through that whole process. But yeah, yeah. Just that was like a fucking Tuesday, just a normal ass day. Good. Uh, So What's your real estate investing look like today? Like where are you at today? Yeah, so I'm in an uh, an odd spot right now where I'm actually focusing on figuring out what I want it to look like moving forward. Uh, I'm really grateful to be in the spot that I'm in where, you know, I make enough money to live pretty comfortably. You know, I do some flips. I do some wholesaling. I don't actively really pursue either of those, but as opportunities present themselves, I will capitalize on them. You know, I do a uh, short term is kind of you know, short to midterm rentals are kind of my bread and butter right now. That's really what I'd like to focus on. But yeah, right now I'm kind of trying to figure it all out and see you know, what type of machine I want to build and how big I want to build it. Cause that's one of the things I'm focusing on right now. Uh, Cause it's easy when you're like, when you're working a W2 job, it's really easy to be like, I'm going to buy so much real estate. I'm going to make, you know, a hundred million dollars a year. And like, you know, I'm going to be the next Grant Cardone. I'm going to, you know, you know, Ed Milet, whatever. It's really easy to do that. And now seeing that and being a little further down the road, I'm not saying I'm not going to do that. Mm. I'm just saying I'm going to take a break. I'm going to see what I want to focus on. But, you know, I mean, we're still managing a good chunk of my portfolio in house. Uh, I, you know, I have a maintenance team that works for me. So, I mean, I'm, I'm staying busy with that type of stuff and I'm in the process of kind of automating all that shit. And then I don't know, we'll see what I want to invest in. You know, it's a, it's a good place to be, you know, get to that point where you can, uh, you can do whatever the fuck you want. You know, you want to build a bigger machine. Awesome. Build a bigger machine. You want to fuck off on vacation a couple times a year. I mean, go do that. So yeah, yeah. cause you were not too long, you know, a year or two ago, you were, I mean, you had to be heavily involved with the day-to-day operations of the business because you were building the business. And oh, for sure. Now that you have built that business, you can now take a step back and say, okay, what are my inefficiencies? Because my income's taken care of. My day-to-day income is mm-hmm. taken care of. You are now financially free. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Now what do you got to do? <laughs> so that's exactly what you can work on. I think what you're doing right, because now you can focus on the big picture of how you want your business to look like. And you can be more picky and choosy about what type of properties and investments you want to take on in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just sold off a couple of properties that uh, really didn't fit the, uh, the description of where I wanted to go. And they were, they were decent cash flow properties. They just weren't really where I envisioned my company going in the future. And obviously as we're recording this, the market's so hot right now, it's a very good time to sell a property if you aren't sure that you want it. So I, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm in a fortunate position where I can really evaluate. Well, I think that's a good ending spot. I think you explained yourself pretty well, and that was a good, uh, it was nice to interview the real Bobby Klein. Thank you. Thank you. It was good to be interviewed. Yeah. Yeah.
All right, so that is episode one in the books. Um, Bobby, do you want to leave anybody with any little? Uh, I, I know Golden Nugget is one that I'm stealing from another podcast right now, but Golden is it? Nugget, yeah, I don't know what podcast it's from, so that's great. Yeah, they won't either. Hopefully, <laughs> okay. So if I if I had one like Golden Nugget to uh, impart here, it would be this: when you, if you are if you're new and you're trying to get started in real estate it's going to be really important to make relationships with various types of people. So there's people like, like us who are still on our journey just at different points, still, still building wealth though. And then there are also people who have been in the game a little bit longer who are maybe not trying to tackle deals anymore, or maybe very, they're only taking on very select deals. Those people are going to be so valuable to connect with because I'm unlikely to send you a great deal with where I'm at in my investing cycle. Mm -hmm. And most people who are building their wealth right now are not going to send you great deals. But if you can make connections with those people who are kind of done building their wealth and they're really just preserving, those people get sent deals all the time because people know they can buy, but they're not buying. So they can pass those on to whoever the first person they think of is. And if you're the dude who's bringing them coffee or you're the dude who is you know, getting in good enough with them to, you know, be on the phone with them, send them text messages, be top of mind with them. It's a good chance that you're going to end up getting those deals brought to you. That is a good golden nugget. I might have to make some phone calls after this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they also transition transition really well into uh, lenders. So that's true. Yeah. You can utilize. I mean, there's definitely people we have both probably used that, you know, they, they're just done. They're done building. They're, you know, they're at their, fi- yeah. they're way past financial freedom. Now. <laughs> they're at right. what we're trying to build too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And those, those guys are um, just fantastic people to have in your corner. And I found that they tend to be very generous with their time. Again, it all comes back to if you're out there, you're hustling, you're making shit happen. You're going to feel like you're spinning your wheels and spinning your wheels and spinning your wheels for so long. <laughs> but if, if you keep hustling, keep doing that, people will notice yep. and you'll be rewarded for it. All right. That is episode one. That was a good show. I like that. We're going to fine tune so. this eventually and hopefully we get really good at this. Uh, but you can find me on Instagram uh, at Logan Zuber 17. This is at Bobby Klein 89. Yep. And then also Bobby and Logan.com. If you want to be on the show, if you think you have a good disaster story until then try to avoid any disasters.